I have the great pleasure to introduce Professor Eileen Gibney. Eileen is a professor of nutrition at the University College in Dublin, and her research interests are broad, covering much of the food system, and she focuses on the area of personalized nutrition, where she investigates response, including inter-individual variation in response to nutrition interventions. She develops strategies and innovative technologies for personalized dietary and lifestyle feedback, including supporting the transition to healthy and sustainable diets. So she has led several intervention studies examining response to different dairy foods, including alternative production systems, and she also considers the food environment, examining provision of foods and delivery of population nutrition guidance. So she has been a principal investigator on many national and international studies, and this includes large projects such as the Food for Me, the Food for Health Ireland, Insights, and Evanes Cloud. Eileen is also the director of the UCD Institute of Food and Health. She's currently a trustee of the Nutrition Society of the UK and Ireland. And she also sits on various national committees, including the Public Health Nutrition Subcommittee in the Food Safety Authority of Ireland and Safe Foods Advisory Committee. Eileen will present to us today challenges and opportunities of plant-rich diets to deliver adequate nutrition and to meet environmental targets. Eileen, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, so today I have been, and I will talk about uh, the, the opportunities that we have in, in, in transitioning towards plant-rich diet, but also the challenges that this face to get this right. So I don't have any conflicts of interest, but in the interest of transparency, I am declaring research funding from a number of, of different organizations. So what am I gonna talk about? Why are we bothered about plant-rich diets? Where are we going with this and why is it important? And then I think it's important for us to consider what do we mean by plant-rich diet. And when we get to that point, we have to then say there are both challenges and opportunities in this transition. And we have to begin to think about those so that we can uh, correctly advise individuals and support them in their transition uh, to a more sustainable focused diet. So look at the challenges that we have. We need to maintain adequate population health. We need to find a balance in terms of planetary health. And we have, I suppose, significant challenges. On one hand, we have rising obesity in developing countries. We also have hidden malnutrition within those countries, but we also have rising hunger and malnutrition in more developed, uh, developing countries. And this can be exacerbated by geopolitical sort of uh, issues, et cetera, as well. Amongst all of this, we are seeing increasing social inequalities, um, and we are seeing a rapidly changing climate, which will affect everything about our, our daily lives, and particularly about the food and the food chain that we, uh, we have. So why is food important in this? Well, food will contribute about 20% of global emissions. And this can be broken down into a number of areas like supply chain, crop production, and land use. And if you simplify this, of those emissions, about 80% will come from the production side. And about 20% will come from, I suppose, that supply chain, the retail environment, and then what we do at home. So we have, I suppose, as consumers, hopefully this might work, if I can point, too small. Okay. If we can point uh, at the, you know, we can make changes um, how we produce food, but we also need to make significant changes about how we consume our food. And if we want to look at transforming a food system, we have to make sure, and this has been pointed out by uh, numerous people today, that we have to look at transforming in a way that makes sure we have affordable, desirable, available, and accessible foods. Okay, so we really have to look at that. And in doing so, we have to support consumers and populations in making the right choices. So what do we mean by a plant-rich diet? Or what do I mean by a plant-rich diet? When we begin to look at what sustainable dietary guidelines are, and there's a number of these that have been summarized by Katie Davis in our group in, in Dublin, we can summarize them across all of them by saying you should have regular and abundant vegetables, fruits, whole grains, etc. There are then a section of, I suppose, animal proteins where the advice is either to avoid, maybe do not consume regularly, or to reduce. 
And then the final sort of, I suppose, cluster advice is around your plant proteins to increase, to choose more, and to have these more regularly and abundantly within your diet. So if we take those three principles, we need to begin to make changes to our current health eating advice, but also to, uh, to support individuals in, in doing so. If we look at, I suppose, the reference diets that exist, so that's dietary advice. If we look at how we might implement these, maybe using some of the reference diets, again, you can see a variation in advice potentially around the amount that we should be consuming per day um, and the types of the different food items within those. But we have to begin to sort of say, we know the principles that we want to be moving towards and how are we going to get there? So what are those challenges then that we have within moving towards this plant-rich diet? Well, firstly, there's a huge, I suppose, consumer under, uh, not understanding, a desire and an interest in plant-rich diets. And this is a study that looked at, I suppose, relative search volumes of consumers across Europe. And I thought this was really interesting to show that in the last few years, there's been a significant rise in search, in search terms on the internet in terms of individuals really looking towards sustainability, food sustainability. So consumers need, or seem to be wanting to go more forward with this transition. But if you look at a review that was conducted by Janice Harrington and other colleagues um, in Ireland, there are a number of, I suppose, barriers or constructs that need to be supported for individuals to move towards that. So you will have structural determinants like social class and education will have a significant influence on whether people will change, or they currently do. Whether individuals then, if you look on the intermediary determinants, it will talk about things like budget and income or political values or an understanding of why an individual needs to move towards that. So on both the individual level and on those macro levels, we really need to begin to support individuals in moving towards this, but also to give them the right advice. Another study that was recently published was looking at uh, attitudes, and this mirrors what was found in, in Jane and uh, Janice's uh, review, where they said about 35, 40% were concerned about food waste, but actually, for those that would, had made a change, it was higher education and, and, and an income that will actually do this, but those who are of a lower, uh, I suppose, socioeconomic status or are obese were less likely to make any changes. So you're going to see greater inequality um, the more we move towards uh, pushing people towards us, and we do not want to create bigger inequality than we have. Okay, so let's look at the principles of what we should be doing in terms of public health advice. So try to simplify these in that we should be eliminating nutrition deficiencies, we should be optimizing our nutrient intake, and food must be, as we said before, available, affordable, and acceptable. And all of this goes into the food pyramid, essentially, and we give baseline sort of dietary advice. This is our standard food pyramid from uh, Ireland. But let's look at what might happen to nutrient deficiencies as we move towards a plant-rich diet. And I'm going to focus on some work from Sarah Bath, um, who uh, looked at, I suppose, iodine content of some foods. And as you can see, within the plant-rich foods, we see very low iodine content compared to those animal product foods. So you see 60 micrograms compared to maybe five grams in nuts, in, in milk and yogurt compared to nuts. You can see a, a greater amount in fish, um, but very quite low in, you know, in, in our plant foods. Is this a problem? Well, it is a problem when you look at the contribution that animal products make to iodine intake. And again, within this study, she noted that you can have a huge variation with up to, you know, 82% in Iceland, looking at sort of over 50% in Ireland of the iodine content comes from um, animal products. So if we are reducing our reliance on those, we need to make sure that we're not walking ourselves into a, a, a population that may become micronutrient deficient, in particular micronutrients. Sarah has also gone on then to look at calculating dietary intakes, and she took the Eat Lancet reference diet, and using the advice based on, given within the Eat Lancet diet, she calculated 128 micrograms per day intake, and that was about 85 to uh, 
Uh, 85% of the recommended intake for adults, but only about 50 for that for, for pregnancy. She then did the same diet, but replaced the milk with unfortified plant-based alternatives. And this is a, an approach that is being followed by a lot of consumers. And in doing so, it reduced the intake of iodine to 50 micrograms per day, reaching only about 30% of the recommended intake. Again, what this noticing is that it may place consumers at uh, increased risk of iodine deficiency unless we begin to think about how we can fortify or support consumers in the consumption of those particular nutrients. Also want to highlight um, Leona Lindbergh's work. I can see her sitting here. I think she's already uh, presented this just before. And um, she looked at doing an audit of plant-based meat alternatives and looking at the nutritional content of these meat alternatives, looking at on-pack information and then modeling those against uh, uh, sort of plant-based and then non-plant-based uh, comparators. And whilst the table is a little bit busy there, what you can see is that overall there is lower protein and lower fat, but particularly saturated fat. So we might be happy with the reduction in fat and saturated fat, but we need to be careful that we're maintaining adequate protein intakes and available protein intakes. Moving towards the plant-rich or the plant-based alternates, you will see an increase in fiber, but you also see an increase in sugar and salt. So again, it is worth making sure that we uh, look at the right nutrients when transitioning towards these. So look again then at, if we look on the other side, optimizing nutrient intake to minimize disease, and again, look at affordability and acceptability. And I'm going to talk about some uh, work from some colleagues, um, again, Sinead McCarthy and Janice Harrington and uh, Clarissa, who looked at a systematic review, a really nice systematic review on 24 studies. And they looked at the correlations between diet, basal, uh, BMI, greenhouse gas emissions, but also cost. And they note that healthy diets will definitely reduce environmental impact. Okay, but there are incongruities between planet health and population health. So you will see as you transition that we will begin to see some nutrient deficiencies within those and we need to watch out for that. Sustainability of dietary patterns will depend on the choice of indicator. So in this one, they looked at greenhouse gas emissions, but even within that, there are different ways in which we can define or quantify the greenhouse gas emissions of our diet. And again, we need to begin to, I suppose, find a standard about which we do that. Following lower impact diets is protective of BMI, as that they were looking at the risk of obesity, but it does increase the cost. And they've highlighted again that inequality, that affordability, and this was raised in other uh, presentations that I've heard this morning. So we need to begin to find that, I suppose, sweet spot of actually uh, ensuring that we have a diet that is sustainable, nutritionally replete, but also affordable for everybody. But there are opportunities and we definitely need to do something. Okay, so let's not stick our head in the sand. And work by Sinead McCarthy, again, within the, the joint project that we're doing in, in, in Ireland, has shown that if we actually simply followed the advice that we were given, everything would be solved. So we can all go home now, okay? Uh, if she has modeled that if you reduce your intake of sugar, fat, and salt um, to the recommended amount, again, the same with poultry, fish, and eggs, and we increase our fruit and vegetables. So this is, sorry, I'm too small to actually get this done properly on that side. And then if you look at the changes in CO2, they actually mirror what we will be doing and what we're recommending individuals to do. But we're not doing it. We haven't been doing this. Okay, so this is the advice. We're not following it. So the area that we work in is trying to see, well, actually, if we gave personalized advice, would it help individuals to achieve uh, recommendations? So if we consider health, environment, acceptance, et cetera, and what consumers ask, so is it good for their health? Can they buy it? And what do they do with it? And would they like it? If we can provide advice that is personalized to those individuals, can we make an impact on that? So what do I mean by personalized nutrition? Well, essentially what we have on one side is a one-size-fits-all nutritional recommendations in terms of something like the food-based dietary guidelines as an example. However, in terms of personalized, what we try to do is to look at factors that we know influence decisions. 
and information and on what people consume. So what we're able to do is taking that, tailor and give individuals or groups of individuals specific advice that helps them to make the right changes for their own diet. So rather than the one size fits all, it's an individual approach or a group based approach based on sort of systematic decision trees that we can develop. So within the SUHI Guide project, which is a project uh, funded um, within uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland, what we are looking at is trying to look, we know there's a need for population change. We know that we need to move towards a healthy and sustainable diet. However, there is an imp or there's a lack of data on understanding the nutritional status and how moving from a uh, healthy eating uh, approach, as, as noted there, towards a more sustainable approach, does it impact our nutritional status? What we're also testing within this is considering the use of personalized strategies to support behavioral change within population health. So we know people want to do this, but people are uncertain. We've noted the barriers in some of those reviews about education, about understanding how to do that. So if we offer those strategies, can it help? So what we have is a multi-center randomized control trial examining the impact of personalized nutrition strategies for healthy, sustainable diets on nutrient intake and status. Now, this is just finished. Uh, we're in the middle of analyzing uh, the, the biological samples, but I do have some preliminary data on uh, the, the findings we have in terms of the, the consumer response, but also the, uh, the dietary intake side. So what we're looking at within this is one group that would have a, uh, on, on the top, personalized general healthy eating advice. And on the other hand, what we would also have is personalized advice, which is both nutritionally replete, but also cognizant of planetary health. So a sustainable personalized uh, nutritional advice. And in a perfect world, if people followed what they would be doing and stuck to it, which we hope they would do with our advice, we would see a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And I've demonstrated that in the slide previously when Sinead McCarthy did that modeling. But actually, if we can also then advise them and support them in choosing plant-rich diets or more sustainable diet, we could further reduce that to an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So this is the ideal. And what we've done really is to sort of say, can that more sustainable diet decrease greenhouse gas emissions to a greater extent than supporting individuals and just following the general health eating guideline? So what we had is we had a study that was a multi-center study in Queen's University Belfast, University College Dublin, and University College Cork. It was a 12-week randomized control trial where people were either put on general healthy eating or sustainable healthy eating personalized advice. There were 360 individuals, 120 across each center, and our primary outcome was this change in dietary intake in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but we also took blood. So we will be able to assess nutrient status and health biomarkers at zero and 12 weeks within those. So what did we find? In initial pilot study, we did find that uh, within the control, Although individuals, we gave them healthy advice, they really didn't change their greenhouse gas emissions. But within the intervention, the changes that we recommended potentially show a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions for these individuals who were able to follow these over the 12 week period. So what we're seeing is that the personalized advice really is supporting individuals in making uh, specific uh, changes within those. However, we did also ask questions about how easy it was, how much did they like this. And what we want to note here is, you know, how easy or difficult was it to change each of the elements within the diet? And one of the areas we want to focus on here is that the consumers were, or participants reported it was reasonably easy to reduce red and processed meat. Okay, so you can have a very, very easy or easy taking up much of those in the blue. Um, you have the, uh, in, uh, sorry, the, the, the rec normal recommended guidelines and the green was the personalized. So we can see that those were personalized, found it a lot easier because they were given advice. And that was the difficulty that was reported that they were very easy to reduce these, but they didn't know what to replace them with. So we do need to be able to support consumers in making the right decisions and giving them the right choices so that they can follow those. 
If we looked at dairy, when we looked at the intakes, we actually had to kind of recommend an increase in dairy because a lot of individuals had a very low dairy, and if we wanted to meet the recommended intakes of approximately three portions a day or two to three portions a day, again, there was a, well, well, this time there was a wider distribution. So individuals, some found it easy, some didn't. So there are parts of the diet that will be easier for individuals to change. There are parts that won't. And if we begin to gather that information, it will allow us to really help the population and understand the difficulties around that. So that's in an intervention study, but we really need to begin to move this towards real life. And I'm part of a Plan Eat uh, Horizon Europe project that is looking at applying this kind of research to living labs around Europe. So you'll see that there are nine living labs in Plan Eat study. Um, and the, the Planet Project, ours is focused within University College Dublin, and what we're trying to do is to take the learnings that we have from SUHI and the existing research and apply that to the campus environment. So not looking to change an individual's environment, to, uh, an individual's choices, but to also support them in the environment in which they're making these choices. So trying to influence policy, trying to influence the availability of food, the price of the food. So not just changing those individual components, but changing to that micro level, but those uh, macro and meso levels as well within terms of behavioral change. The number of the other living labs are across Europe and they're addressing different population groups like children and older adults and clinical environments. So what this study is really trying to do is to taking the key findings that are here at the moment and pushing those out into that real life environment. So you'll see the results of these over the next few years that are coming forward. And if you want to know more about it, just reach out to me and I'll be able to, to share. So what do I think the key findings are? We are and have to be cognizant of both population and planetary health. There's an awful lot of talk about sustainability, which is amazing to see at FENS, but we have to make sure that any advice we give is nutritionally replete. We have to really understand then what do we mean by a sustainable diet. So we talk about sustainable diet, but maybe it has to be a, a sustainable, nutritious diet as well. We do see difficulty in consumer acceptance. We're going to offer advice to individuals, but we have to support them in making those changes. And studies like the one I've described in SUHI will really help us understand where are the blocks, where are the opportunities, and how can we support individuals, and, and what is causing those individuals to maybe adopt a change or not. We do need to be cognizant of cost, and this has been mentioned uh, a, a number of times in a number of studies. And we need to keep an eye on that nutrient quality. And as I said, we will be looking at nutritional status in our study. So hopefully by the next FENS or before that, definitely we'll have uh, some key findings from SUHI within that. So that's all I wanted to say today. Thank you.